Nvidia is launching the next GPU in their 4000 series lineup and today's video is going to be all about this RTX 4060 graphics card. It will cost you $300 in the US or about 330 euros here in the EU, which is $100 less than the 4060 Ti and about $30 more than the AMD Radeon RX 7600. There's no Founders Edition, but I do have the Gigabyte Windforce OC as well as the Pallet Dual right here. So let's see how the RTX 4060 chip performs in 30 different games on 1080p and 1440p and how these two models compare to each other in terms of thermals, noise and power consumption. Let's begin. Looking at the specs, it does seem like NVIDIA is pretty much focusing on the performance of their CUDA, RT and Tensor cores, uh, on the addition of DLSS 3 and the fact that the 4060 should use a lot less power than its predecessor. The actual core count is lower than on the 3060, uh, just like the 4060 Ti has less cores than the 3060 Ti. They went with an 8GB memory buffer and 128-bit memory bus, and even though NVIDIA claims that their improved cache should kind of compensate for that, the reality is that it will stop you from playing some games at the highest settings, even on 1080p resolution. But let's look at the performance. Now, for this video, I will be comparing the RTX 4060 to its direct competitor, the RX 7600 from AMD, the most likely upgrade, the RTX 4060 Ti, and the RTX 3060 Ti, which you can currently buy for the same ish price. And as always, if you want to know the details about my test benches and all the other testing conditions, uh, do check the description of this video because I will leave all the details down below. Anyway, starting with Spider-Man Remastered, the 4060 was beating the RX 7600 by about 20% in average FPS on 1080p and 1440p, and it ended up just ahead of the 3060 Ti as well. But the 4060 Ti is pretty far ahead, uh, by about 20% on 1080p and a bit more on 1440p. In God of War, the 4000 series cards don't look as good. The 4060 was ahead of the Radeon RX 7600, but only by a little bit, while the RTX 3060 Ti ended up pretty far ahead. In Assassin's Creed Valhalla, the 4060 roughly matches the RX 7600 at both 1080p and 1440p, with the RTX 4060 Ti offering a small upgrade. The 3060 Ti is a bit slower on 1080p, but then pulls ahead on 1440p resolution. In Dying Light 2, the 4060 is just ahead of the RX 7600, but both cards drop below 60 FPS on 1440p, while the 3060 Ti and the 4060 Ti manage to stay above it. Cyberpunk 2077 result was a bit surprising. It's a game that is heavily affiliated with Nvidia, but the 4060 ended up behind the RX 7600, uh, managing good 1080p performance, but disappointing 1440p performance without DLSS. Doom Eternal is a super easy game to run with all cards easily managing better frame rates than most modern monitors can display, but it is still nice to see that raw performance with the 4060 being a bit ahead of the RX 7600 on both resolutions, but the 3060 Ti and the 4060 Ti ended up quite far ahead. Formula 1 2022 on ultra high does include some ray tracing effects, so it becomes uh, pretty hard to run it on all cards here, but ray tracing hurts AMD more than it does Nvidia. On 1080p, the 4060 keeps its 1% lows above 60, while the 7600 drops below. On 1440p, only the 4060 Ti manages to keep it playable without upscaling. Microsoft Flight Simulator is a very heavy game to run, but it clearly likes the 4060 more than it likes the RX 7600. It is the first game where we see the 4060 drop below 60 FPS, even on 1080p, although we were running this game on ultra settings. In CSGO, the RTX 4060 has a very small lead over the RX 7600, but as you can see in this graph, if you only play CSGO, you should probably consider getting a 30 series card instead. Modern Warfare 2, on the other hand, uh, suits AMD's latest cards a lot better than it does in videos. On 1080p, the 4060 is quite a bit behind the RX 7600, which sits closer to the 4060 Ti. But the 4060 does beat the 3060 Ti on 1080p. 
To keep it a bit shorter, I'm not going to talk about every single individual game because most kind of do follow the same trend of what you can expect from this card, so let's look at some summaries instead. On 1080p, the RTX 4060 offers 90 FPS or more in the majority of the 30 games I tested. It only drops below 60 FPS in Flight Simulator, but then you can use the LSS to get some better numbers. In some games, like the Red Dead Redemption, DLSS upscaling doesn't help that much, so if you want more performance, you will have to drop some graphics settings. But again, this card will run pretty much every game comfortably at 1080p resolution on either high or ultra settings. And even though Nvidia is happy with this, because they kind of insist this is meant to be a 1080p card, 1440p resolution is becoming pretty mainstream, and I think it's pretty realistic to expect a $300 GPU to be able to run games on that resolution as well. But 1440p is a bit trickier for the 4060. A large number of games struggle to even hit 60 FPS. Now, we can get most of them over that 60 FPS mark using DLSS, with Red Dead Redemption being the only game that would require you to drop the graphic settings instead. So, you can manage 1440p as well, but ideally you would want to get something a bit stronger if you want to play at this resolution. Now, if I compare it to the RTX 4060 Ti, uh, that is a $400 card, so it is 33% more expensive, the Ti is about 23% faster on 1080p and 26% faster on 1440p. So technically, the 4060 offers better value per dollar, but I think a 25% performance difference is actually quite significant and it is more than I personally expected. Now, compared to the RTX 3060 Ti, the 3060 Ti is faster in the majority of games and significantly so in several of them. Now, on average, the RTX 3060 Ti is about 10% faster on 1080p, which was really surprising to me, because I don't think that in raw performance, a last generation card should be faster than the brand new 4060 graphics card. And on 1440p, the gap is even worse. The 3060 Ti is faster in every single game with an average of 17%, which is yet again, Quite a lot. Compared to the Radeon RX 7600 on 1080p, uh, both cards actually managed to win the exact same number of games. Now, most games show single digit percentages, but there are a couple of titles that really favor one card over the other. So, while on average the 4060 is about 1% ahead, I would say that they are pretty equal. And if you're into one particular game, uh, you can keep these small differences in mind. On 1440p, AMD wins 14 games, uh, Nvidia 12, but on average with slightly larger margin, uh, putting the 4060 ahead by about 2%. Again, this is a super small difference and I would consider them to be pretty equal on this resolution as well. But one area where the 4060 does really well is power consumption. It averaged just under 115 watts in gaming, which means that it uses 67 watts less than the RX 7600 for roughly the same performance. Uh, even if you pay a relatively low price for power, uh, let's say 20 cents per kilowatt hour, if you play four hours every day, you will actually save about $80 over four years uh, using a 4060 instead of a 7600. And with higher energy rates, like many of us have in Europe, that number can look a lot worse. At four hours of gaming per day and 50 cents per kilowatt hour, the difference is almost 200 euros. And as a result, I do think that the 4060 does look like the more attractive option next to the RX 7600, even before counting some other feature advantages like uh, DLSS 3, the Advent encoder, and so on. And yes, the 4060 seems very disappointing when you compare its raw performance to the last generation 3060 Ti, but if you look at the efficiency, things do look a bit better. The 3060 Ti is a 200 watt card, and I know that a lot of you don't really care about power consumption or power cost at all, but for anyone that does several hours of gaming every single day and pays for their own electric bill, the reality is that you shouldn't really ignore this topic because it can make a difference. 
Low power also means that you should generally expect most 4060s to run cool and quiet enough and that you won't need some uh, ridiculously large and expensive cooler design to get decent thermals. Uh, but after testing several 4060s in the last few days, it did prove that you cannot just blindly buy any of them either. I am actually only allowed to talk about these two uh, MSRP cards today, but I do have another video going live tomorrow where I will cover some more premium models that uh, do carry a higher price as well. Anyway, a Gigabyte Windforce OC is a very compact two-fan card. It is only 19 centimeters long and it is pretty thin and light with a weight of only 507 grams. It doesn't have much in terms of features. Uh, there's no RGB, there's no dual BIOS, but it does have a plastic backplate and like most cards these days, it does come with a fan stop feature. On the back, there are two HDMI ports and two display ports, while most other models, including the palette here, will have three display ports and one HDMI port. The palette is slightly larger with a length of about 25 centimeters, so it might not fit in some super small cases, but it will look a bit more impressive if you have a larger mid-tower model. With the 646 grams, it is a bit heavier as well, and it does have a little white LED line on it. Now, there's no RGB, uh, no dual BIOS, but again, you get a fan stop feature when the card has very little to do. Both cards use a standard 8-pin power connector, which is plenty for a 115-watt card. In terms of gaming performance, uh, there is basically no difference between these two cards. Uh, the palette manages slightly higher clock speeds, but the difference is irrelevant and in actual games uh, there isn't a single frame difference between these two models. But where you would realistically expect uh, even a tiny card like the Windforce to manage 115 watts easily, this particular design isn't actually doing that well. It runs its cores 11 degrees hotter than the Palette Dual, and on the hotspot there is a 14 degree difference, which actually puts Gigabyte pretty close to thermal throttling. And this is not happening because the fans are not spinning, because they were running at uh, well over 2500 RPM, causing a lot more noise than the Pallet as well, which runs reasonably quiet. Now, I did check with several other reviewers that were testing the exact same model, and they all kind of reported similar numbers. So there is definitely something wrong, um, either with this whole design or maybe with this particular production batch. And I will put an update in the description down below uh, once I learn a bit more about this. But until we figure this out, I would avoid this Windforce model completely. The palette here is a pretty safe bet. Now, I do expect larger premium versions to manage even lower temps and less noise, but the palette here just proves that you do not need to spend more than the MSRP to get a decent RTX 4060. One feature that sets the 4000 series apart is DLSS3 upscaling, which includes AI frame generation. And that means that the GPU basically uses AI to generate an extra frame in between two existing frames. And depending on the card, this can help situations where your frame rate is limited by your CPU, and it can also help to increase the frame rate in those uh, heavier AAA titles that are just too hard to run to begin with. But as I said before, it is not always perfect and its benefits will very much depend on the card that you're using and on the game that you're playing. Now, Microsoft Flight Simulator is one of the better examples where DLSS and frame generation really helps out. In a native render, it's actually very hard to run this game. Enabling DLSS results in a much better experience on 1080p, but on 1440p, frame generation will help the game become nice and playable. There is a latency penalty here, but in a slow-paced game like this one, it is totally worth the extra frames. But in Spider-Man, for example, at 1080p resolution, with high settings and ray tracing enabled, the 4060 manages to do just fine without it. Enabling DLSS upscaling makes sense, as that increases the frame rates and reduces latency while it looks just as good but frame generation increases the latency while you don't really benefit from those extra frames. And even on 1440p, I would say that just using DLSS upscaling hits the best balance between frame rates and latency. In Dying Light 2, with the game set to its highest ray tracing high preset and on 1080p, you do get a bit higher frame rate with frame generation and the latency is close to a native render, but just using upscaling will offer the best experience overall. 
On 1440p, you can forget about using the highest settings with ray tracing because uh, even frame generation cannot really make enough of a difference to give you that smooth gameplay. You would have to either uh, drop ray tracing or maybe drop some other settings uh, depending on your personal preference. In Formula 1 2022, it actually depends on your resolution. On 1080p, I would say the extra frames that frame generation offers um, are quite nice. It looks noticeably smoother and the latency difference is insignificant. But on 1440p, it makes almost no real difference, while the latency uh, is a lot higher than when just using upscaling. So here, you would want to turn frame generation off. The Witcher 3 is another good use case for frame generation on a 4060. In the highest RT Ultra preset, the game runs yeah, pretty bad, uh, either at a native render or with just upscaling. But with frame generation on, it runs nicely. On 1440p, uh, similar to Dying Light, you will have to drop ray tracing or some other settings to make the game run smoothly. And finally, Cyberpunk 2077 in its fully path-traced RT overdrive mode. It just runs really poorly on this brand new $300 RTX GPU. Now, I guess it's okay if you're just fine with 1% lows just above 30 FPS, but in my opinion, the best way to play Cyberpunk on a 4060 is to just disable ray tracing and just play it on high with DLSS enabled. And I do think it is disappointing to see that the biggest RTX showcase title doesn't really run properly on the latest NVIDIA RTX graphics card. Whatever the next RT Overdrive title will be, uh, chances are that your 4060 might not be able to run it at all. I think the 4060 is pretty underwhelming overall. It just feels like they focused a lot on features and on AI and improved efficiency uh, while leaving the raw performance behind. It is actually slower than the 3060 Ti and that is nothing short of embarrassing. That being said, if you factor in the power difference, the 4060 will end up significantly cheaper after a few years for yeah, most people around the world, making the 3060 Ti a bit less interesting than it seems right away. But that is still quite a leap, considering that the 3060 Ti will give you more performance throughout those years. So yeah, even though NVIDIA is really pushing a frame generation in their marketing, DLSS 3 isn't nearly as widespread as the LSS2, and it's not always a better choice. And if I'm being honest here, uh, frame generation should be a bonus. It should be an extra feature that is added to the raw performance. Uh, it shouldn't be the fundamental reason to justify this new generation of graphics cards. If you are deciding between the RTX 4060 and an RX 7600, which is about as fast while costing 10% less, when you start factoring in its much higher power draw, the 4060 does feel like a much better deal between the two. And that is before we start factoring in features like DLSS and frame generation and NVIDIA's encoder and so on. So if you just compare it to the AMD, NVIDIA did enough to end up on top, but barely. The 4060 Ti is 25-ish percent faster if you're able to spend another $100. And the 4070 is even more expensive, but much faster and it has more VRAM, which will be invaluable if you're going for 1440p resolution. So yeah. I believe that NVIDIA did barely enough, yet again, to position this card where they want it to be and with the price that they can charge for it because uh, the competition in this segment is pretty slim. And until AMD comes up with something that is a lot more interesting, this is just what we have to choose from, uh, whether we like it or not. That is all I have to say about this card, but before I go, uh, let's check out the sponsor of this video. This video is brought to you by Corsair and their RMX Shift power supplies. These fully modular power supplies are very unique as they come with connections on the side instead of the back, making it easier than ever to add and remove cables as well as cable manage your build. They are extremely reliable and power efficient and due to their low noise fans that stop completely under 50% load, they are also extremely quiet. You get a variety of cables for any system you have in mind, including the 12 volt high power connection connection, and on top of that, you get a nice 10-year long warranty. Check them out using the links in the description below. Thank you so much for watching, guys. I'm really happy you stayed till the end. Let me know in the comments down below what do you think about this video, and while you're there, don't forget to click that subscribe button so you never miss my future uploads. Bye, guys, and I will see you in the next one. Bye!